command? Command, you're having interference. Can you repeat? Can you repeat? Hi, this is Steve from Pixel Bump. Welcome to our new tutorial on digital distortion. We're going to explore a couple different concepts in compositing, as well as how to create a digital noise effect with time displacement and digital glitches. So the two shots we're going to look at today are from the short you just watched here, where Amber is just operating the ship and we have a nice digital set that she's sitting on. And this shot here, where we can see the video of Eric trying to give her a warning message with all its digital glitching glory. So to start, I just shot Amber here on a green screen. And if we look here at frame 50 in both of them, you can see this is the exact same shot. Uh, the final shot just has a lot of treatment on it and a lot of extra elements. And the same goes with this shot here let me just line it up. The only real difference is Amber has been repositioned into the scene, but other than that, it's gonna be a very similar workflow to the first shot. And let's get started. So the first thing I'm gonna to need to do here is create some digital assets. She needs a set to be on. And to do that, I went into Maya. I have been lucky enough recently to be working on a job that uses the Arnold renderer. And if you don't know what the Arnold renderer is, it is much like the RenderMan renderer from Pixar. It is a very nice photorealistic render that gives you beautiful results with a very quick speed. And you can see here, it's been used in a lot of different situations on a lot of films, TV that you've watched and just gives phenomenally beautiful results. And so the first thing I had to do was come in and swap out all my textures. All the textures came in as regular Blin and Fong materials, and they really needed to be the type of materials that Arnold understands and Arnold renders well. So I took each of the materials and I switched them from their original Fong and Blin over to my Arnold AI standard material. And the AI standard material has a lot of similarities to other materials you've worked with, but there are a few little things that it wants to do a little differently, and I'll just go over those so you can very quickly get an idea of what the Arnold renderer is capable of. So in the diffuse channel, I went and just used the original material here. It was just a JPEG that the original author of this scene created, and I made that the diffuse materials primary, all right, let's do this. I made it the diffuse materials primary image. And then I came over and working with Arnold for the first time, I went and just set some specular. I knew I wanted some specular highlights. I thought that maybe I'd want some reflection. It looks really bad. Arnold has its own way of behaving and fortunately, Solid Angle has done a really nice job of giving you a preset material library for Maya that you can come in, download these materials, use them in your scene. But what they've also done is given you a quick overview of how these materials are made. So if you want to make a Chrome material, here are the general settings that are gonna work best in their opinion, and then you can tweak from there. So after some trial and error, I realized what I actually wanted for the walls was kind of this very plasticky look. Something more like the ISS or the big influence for this was Ridley Scott's Alien. In that film, there are a lot of sets with metal and plastic. So those are the two things I wanted to really focus on. So in the specular channel, 
I came in and brought in these high value numbers of a 0.76 and a 0.9. Those came straight off of the material presets. And what this does is gives me a big wide specular. Now in Arnold, unlike with some other things, specular is not just the highlights, specular is also the reflections. So something with a very high weight, but a very low roughness will actually give you, will give you somewhat of a mirror-like reflection. Whereas if you bump the up number up fairly high, you'll get a very blurry reflection. And then they also have a reflection channel, which is for mirror-like reflections. If you want just clear, perfect, reflective materials, you're actually gonna wanna focus that here rather than in your specular. After that, a lot of the settings are fairly similar to things that you have been used to. And if you're used to working with standard mental ray or Maya materials, you may be looking for a transparency channel. And the transparency channel doesn't exist in Arnold in the same way. It's a part of the refraction. And down here you have refraction opacity. And the more I bring that down, you'll see here or here that the material starts fading away. And that's because it's becoming more transparent. And this is where you would want to plug in any of your transparency mats. So after running through all the materials here, I ended up with a scene that was ready to be lit and rendered. What I did is came in and just brought in a bunch of neon-like lights for the scene. And I just wanted to kind of give it that feeling of something that was lit heavily with neon, but then I also wanted it to feel like it had a giant sun bursting through that window. So I used a spotlight here in a very low position to kind of simulate the idea of a close by star that would illuminate a lot of this room. But I also wanted a lot of little lights here on the panels. So it would feel like there were a lot of built in lights in the set that were lighting this room. Now I went ahead and used the Arnold area lights for a lot of this. And again, the Arnold light is gonna work a little differently than the light you've worked with in Maya before. Whereas here in the spotlight, this is just a regular Maya spot. And you'll see that the spotlight attributes are pretty much as you'd expect. But here in the Arnold tab, there's a whole nother set of attributes. And to get that yellow color, instead of coloring it here, I came down and played with the color temperature of the light. The lower the color temperature, the warmer it gets. The higher the color temperature, the colder it gets. I wanted something that was lightly warm, kind of like a setting sun. So I went a fairly low number here of 4,600. That seemed like a pretty good place to start. The next thing you want to do is look at your exposure. And the exposure and the intensity are going to work together to give you the illumination you're looking for. The intensity is just the same as in Maya. The exposure kind of clamps that. So if I bring the exposure down to one, it's gonna be a very dim light, even though I have a very high intensity. By having an exposure of five, it's gonna be a fairly bright, fairly powerful light. And to get the kind of softer shadows in this scene, the Arnold user documentation recommends a radius of 0.5 to give you a shadow similar to a sunlight. So it'll be very hard with just a little bit of softness around the edges. Now, each of these lights here for my neons were created very similarly. Now you'll see here that a lot of those Arnold controls from the spotlight are the main controls here for an Arnold light. So the intensity, the exposure, the color temperature, your fall off or decay. And then the last thing I want to mention here are the samples. And the samples are the number of bounces you're going to get for each light. So if you drop it down to one, you see we're getting a very noisy pattern in the light because it only has one bounce. So I brought mine up to 10 so they'd be nice and smooth. There'd be enough bounces. This is a small enclosed space. A lot of that light bouncing around to give a nice radiosity. So each light will affect areas that are not directly in front of it. And then finally, let's just talk a little bit about render settings here. 
And the Arnold renderer has a very simple rendering setup. If you come over here from the common tab and go to the Arnold renderer, this is really the meat of it. This is, these are the settings that you're really gonna play with as you tune your render. And normally when you come in, it's something like three, one, one, one. I think there's two on the subsurface. And then there's one bounce for all of these, and I believe 10 on transparency. I could be wrong, but I think this is pretty close to how it, the default is. And you'll see that it's telling me the combined bounces. And right now I've got a max of 36 bounces. And if I open up the IPR, you're gonna see pretty quickly that we're gonna get a nice illumination and all the areas very close to the lights are rendering very smoothly. You can see that there's not a lot of noise, but everywhere else, there's just gonna be a ton and a ton of noise. And that's because we're not bouncing enough light around the room. Again, small and enclosed space. And I wanted it dimly lit. So to combat the noise, I've gotta bring up my samples quite a bit. So if I start bringing these guys up, Put them all back to three. Here in the transparency, I don't have anything transparent in this particular shot, so I just dropped that down pretty low. And I'm gonna bring up my anti-aliasing samples a little bit. And now you can see it's taken a bit longer for Arnold to chew through a representation of the scene, even at this low image quality. But what we're gonna get is a lot finer noise pattern. And that's gonna work really well in giving us a more beautiful photorealistic render. Now, I will be honest and say that the time, of course, jumps way up for this. So where we started with 36 bounces, we now have 544. That might be a little bit of overkill, but since these were gonna be rendered as stills, I didn't mind waiting an hour for this one frame to render at 2K so that I would have a nice, beautiful background for my shots. So let's go ahead and close out of Arnold here, leave that behind and jump back over to After Effects. And if I go down to my pre-renders, I've got my render here. So let's go ahead and open it up and we'll see that it is a really nice render, not a lot of noise. There's a little bit here and there, but I knew I was gonna be throwing this out of focus with a bit of camera blur, so I wasn't too worried about any of that. And it's just a beautiful render. The Arnold renderer is just really, really nice. And I've been fortunate enough to get to learn it on the job. And it's always nice to learn something when somebody else pays for it. So let's start bringing this first shot together. So I'm gonna go ahead and just run through my typical keying setup. And I'm gonna drop on a reduce noise. And I'll come in auto profile. I'll auto fine tune, I'll apply it. And then I'll bring out primat. And I am not somebody who thinks that the stock After Effects keyer isn't any good. I just prefer primat. And if you are using regular key light, you will still get a great result. So I'm gonna come down to my mat and look for the areas in the background to clean up. Just kind of knock all those out. There we go. A little bit more here and there. We're getting there. There we go. And let's make sure we've got all the foreground that we want. Okay. And then we'll come back. And here we got a little bit more in the background to clean up, it looks like. There we go. And then I'm gonna throw on my advanced spill killer. There we go. A little crunchy around the edges. Maybe I wanna come in and do a little bit of defocusing on the mat, just to clean up a little bit of that crunchiness and shrink it down just a little bit. There we go. 
That's pretty good. Let me shrink it just a little more. There we go. That's a nice edge. Okay, so we've got amber keyed out. Now let's take and drop in our background. And as with all things in compositing, wow, that does not look good at all. <laughs> but we're gonna get it there. And the first thing I wanna do is throw the background out of focus. So I'm gonna take the camera lens blur, drop it on my background, and I'm just gonna play with that setting until I find a level of focus that I like. I think around 10, maybe eight, maybe, yeah, something like that. Um, nine, maybe nine. There we go. That's looking pretty good. So the next thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is bring in a little bit of a vignette. It's a little too evenly lit for this shot. And I wanna keep the focus on Amber here in the center of the screen. So I'm just gonna come down here with a mask. I'm going to subtract it. I'm gonna feather it at a really high number about 500 there we go and then I'll come down and just reduce that until I feel we've got a good number there so about 65 percent that looks pretty good and the next thing I want to do is start playing with a little bit of color correction because amber is very warm the background is very cool they don't match at all at the moment. So let's go ahead and color. Let's color correct amber first, and then we'll come back and color correct the whole image. So I'm going to create, so I'm going to come down here to my curves and maybe drop on a tint. I'll put that before the curves because I want to use the tint to kind of bring in a little bit of a desaturated effect. And then I'm going to grab my curves. I'm going to come to my red channel, pull it down just a little bit. I mean, Amber has really nice red hair, so I don't want to pull it out completely, but I also don't want it to be too distracting come to my blue, maybe add just a little bit of blue to the highlights, not so much to the shadows. Maybe I'll do the same with my green. Less too much there. Just very fine tuning here. Just a little too much there. And let's go ahead and just brighten her up a little bit. There we go. That's looking pretty good. I'll start to believe that that's in the same environment. And then the next thing I'll do is kind of come in and do an overall color correction. And for that one, I'll just use, you now let's use the colorama here. I really just want a tinting effect. So I'm gonna come down to my output cycle and maybe not Caribbean. No, no. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's try that. So let's blend it back in. There we go. Now we're starting to get a nice look for the scene. All right, it's just a very light effect but it makes a nice difference in the overall tone of the colors. So the next thing that Amber has is her giant holographic displays. And that's gonna be a lot of the look of this. And to get those holographic displays, all those widgets, I actually went to Creative Cloud. And if you have Creative Cloud, you get an assets, you get a lot of assets that Adobe is supplying you with. 
And these are great little things. You've got nice filigree, you've got brushes for Photoshop, you've got some nice stock video, uh, or I'm sorry, you've got some nice stock images. And I searched through and I found one called the Dark UI Kit. And this is actually more for a website, but I like the look of all these different little widgets. I thought those would be a lot of fun. I knew they weren't gonna be in focus. I knew you weren't gonna be able to see the detail on them because a lot of them are for shopping buttons and for news feeds and for Twitter feeds. But I knew just the shape was gonna be really nice. There was a lot of nice color and I thought that would work really well. So I downloaded that, brought it into Photoshop, deleted out a bunch of the things I didn't want. And then I Take a second here, and then I spaced them so that you could, so you can see here the, uh, some of the look here, yeah. <laughs> Different levels of uh, subscriptions, but I like these little graphs and things. I thought those were a lot of fun. These little pie charts, those were nice. So I took that and I dropped it into my scene just above Amber's head and then I rotated it in 3D space on the y-axis 180 degrees because we would be looking at it from the back. And then I took it and I scaled it up a little, or I, sorry, I set it in Z space to be a bit closer to us. And then I wanted to find a nice spot where we get to see some of this, but not so much that we would lose Amber's face, which is the really important part. We wanna see what she's seeing. So let's play with that a little bit until we have a nice space for her to look through. Something like that looks pretty good. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take its X rotation and kind of set it back just a little bit. I wanted these screens to be at a little bit of an angle. And then to kind of enhance the holographic look of them. I came in and I used a hue saturation effect and I just colorized each one of them. And this one will make a nice red. This next one will make a green. There we go. And the last one I'm gonna make blue. And now by setting these up in 3D space to offset each other, what I can do is create an, a more depth illusion. And now if I set all of these guys to screen, we start to get the feeling that we're looking through several layers of something. And the last thing I'm gonna do is add a glow to each layer and a camera blur, camera lens blur to each layer. So each one of these, maybe, yeah, five looks pretty decent. Now let's put that blur in front. There we go. And let's solo this guy. I just want it to feel like it's giving off a bit of light. It doesn't have to be super intense because we're gonna combine a bunch of effects here. So let's grab that guy and we'll put it on the others. And there we go. Now we're starting to get a nice look. I think they're a little too far away from each other. So I'm gonna bring them in just a little bit. And let's go ahead and bring down each of their transparencies. So we're just getting a little overly bright everywhere. because we're getting just a little overly bright everywhere and I don't want this to completely wash out. But there we go. Now we're starting to see a nice little holographic effect. And I think I went a little too far with pushing them forward. Want a little more separation. There we go. That looks pretty nice. Let's go ahead and bring down the opacity just a little more. I just don't want it to be too overpowering. I still want to see through them and into this background. 
So now that I've got that guy set up, I'm gonna go ahead and grab my, I'm gonna go ahead and grab the layers of my Photoshop file instead of the flattened file. And I'm gonna drop them into a new composition. And they're gonna be in just a single composition all together. And initially this looks the same as the screen we just used. And the reason we're gonna do this is because now I have the ability to play with individual layers. And when the video screen comes on, I wanted to animate things moving around. And this gave me the ability to do that. So I'm just gonna come in here and switch on and off layers until I find these layers here in the center. That's what I'm looking for. And there we go, that one. And there we go. So now I've got a nice hole here. And that's where the video glitchy, the glitchy video message can play. So now that I've got that, let's go ahead and grab these guys. I'm gonna pre-comp this to be the video screen. And I'm gonna take an edit I did of Eric. And in this edit, he's just sitting on a green screen and I've edited out little chunks. I've repeated areas where he's talking. Let's go ahead and give ourselves a few more frames to work with here. There we go. I'll trim everything back down. Come in here, just give myself more frames to work with again and stretch these guys back out. There we go. And I just did this edit quickly in Premiere and I just tried to focus on consonant sounds. I found that it sounded better to have him go k k k k than ooh, 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 ooh. Your taste may be different. That was just the way I liked the edit. So for this shot, we need to go through a similar structure here and key this guy out. So we're gonna reduce the noise on it. And we'll auto profile, we'll auto fine tune, bring out Primat, and we'll select our background. And then we'll come in and do our cleanup. So clean the background out here. And on this one, I'm actually a little less concerned about the key being perfect because this is gonna get so much treatment in digital noise that it's not gonna be a problem really in the end. So let me turn back on my screen and get Eric somewhat positioned here. And then I'm gonna create a solid with the same color for the border. And I'm just gonna scale it down until it fits nicely behind where Eric is. And we may want to, for a moment here, just turn off the keyer so that we have a better idea of where that video window really is. Stretch it out. And bring in the edges just a little bit. Let's kind of nudge this guy into position. And there we have a nice little border for his video window. So we can turn our keyer back on. And I'm gonna go ahead and pre-comp Eric for now. Eric talking. And that's good for the moment, because all I want to do right now is get this placed. We're gonna come back in a little bit and really work on the digital distortion-y look. But for now, I just wanted that placed. So I'm gonna come over to my project window. Let's rename this comp to back screen. And we'll come in and we'll drop that behind Amber, but above the vignette. And we're gonna come into our 3D layer, 
Let's position it back until it fits. What I want it to do is fit between these two columns here. I want this to be like the projector's generator. So I'm going to do that and let's go ahead and rotate it in the X position a little bit. And like I said, again, we don't really have to worry about Eric's screen because Amber's head is really covering it a lot here. Now I can go ahead and grab some effects from the screen we've already done. And what I'm really concerned here with is the camera lens blur and the glow. I'm a little less concerned with the different layers because we're in the we're going to blur this out so much that we're really not going to see it. Then we had a 9 on the other one, but because this is a little shrinkier, I'm going to really set that back. I'm going to want to really bring in a little more of a glow radius and a little more intensity. And then we'll drop its transparency down a little bit. And let's see what that looks like together. There we go. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Maybe 35. Eh, maybe 40. Just a little back and forth until I find an area I like. And that's starting to look pretty good. So let's go ahead and take a preview and see where we're at. All right. So Looking at this, I'm liking the majority of what I'm seeing. The only thing I don't like is Amber is very, very sharp all around her edges. And we're dealing with a shot that we've created a very narrow depth of field look. So I'm gonna come back to Amber. And the first thing I'm gonna try is defocusing her mat more. See how that looks. And maybe not, because now we're starting to see too much transparency around her edges. So maybe we'll try a little edge blurring. And that's much better. That's more of what I'm looking for. Because her shoulders would definitely not be as in focus as her nose. And we want to create that illusion, that depth is really being handled in camera. And this really just kind of helps you buy that effect. So let's go ahead and preview that again. All right, this is much better. I'm really liking this shot. Now you can go too far with an edge blur. If I bring this way up, we're just gonna get this kind of halo-y look and now we don't look anything like this is in the realm of reality. So you just wanna kind of use your eye, use your best guess as to what feels and looks the best here. So let's start talking about shot two. And for this one, we'll just go ahead really quickly here and we're going to key Amber's footage here. And we'll auto profile, auto fine tune. We'll go ahead and key and we'll clean it up. A lot of digital noise that you're getting from the DSLR here. But it's going to be good enough that we'll get a decent key and be able to composite our shot. All right, let's head back to the comp. Let's do a, any last bits of cleanup we need to do. Let's see, we already know we're gonna need to defocus this guy a little bit and bring in the edge just until we don't see any of that really nasty stuff. And then I'll throw a advanced spill killer on it. There we go. Now a lot of stuff, again, we can steal from what we've already done. So I'm going to come down to Amber, I'm going to grab her color correction, and I'm going to drop it on right away. Now I'm going to grab the main color correction, 
and drop it over the top. That way, when I bring in my background, so let me scale Amber down a little bit. She's a little too big in frame, but that's the good part about keying somebody is now I have all this room to work with and that scale feels about right. So I did make a mistake when I rendered this out and I did not render it with a object mat and I didn't want to go back <laughs> and render it again. So what I did is I ended up just cutting it out and pre-comping it into its own layer. So here you can see the mask that I had created and by pre-comping it back into its own layer, when I added a little bit of blur over the top of it here, you can see there's just a little matte choker, a little lens blur, is it gave me this really nice feeling of something close to the camera and again, gives us a little more of that depth look. So let's go ahead and steal our UI screen again. We'll just grab all three copies. We'll drop it right in. I'm gonna create a I'm going to then attach them all to one so I only have to worry about moving and repositioning one of them. So I'll go to zero and zero and let's go ahead and zero out that position and we'll just move this forward. Now we can start rotating a little bit, getting it more into the position we want. back and get into 3D space nicely. And if we put it behind Amber, we should, oops, all three of them should go back there. There we go. We should be able to position this fairly closely to how we had that other shot set up. So if we come back here and look, we've got that little graph there. So let's go ahead, just bring that down a little bit. Not that anybody would really notice, I think, but it's just nice to pay attention to little details when you're trying to create a set that is completely not real. Little details can go a long way into helping the viewer believe what they're seeing is real. Now, that's looking pretty good, but now we've got a little bit of offset. I'd like a little more here. So I'm gonna bring these guys back until I can feel a little more of that offset. I just wanna be able to see it. And I wasn't catching enough of it before. So there we go, that's looking pretty sharp. Let's make sure our end is all matching up. Now I've gotta bring back in the video screen. And I'm going to go ahead and take off its lens blur for a minute, take off its glow. And I'm going to reset it. Just reset it, come into its rotation, go 180 degrees. So it's backwards. And now I can bring this guy forward and get it positioned a little better. So again, I want that tilt, maybe a little more over here. Let's even out its Z axis. There we go. Maybe two and a half. There we go. Now the big thing I want to look out for is making sure that any part of amber she can be a little cut off, but again, I don't want to obscure her completely. Giving her the feeling of being a little sandwiched is fine. But if I go too far with it, we're definitely going to feel like we're not sure what to look at. So let's go ahead and in position, let's bring that up a little bit more. A little more. There we go. That looks pretty good. Now for this one, because it is in the foreground and we're going to see it a lot clearer, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this guy out as well. And I'm going to position them in 3D space. So they'll have my layers again. 
just come a little closer and the bottom one a little closer still and there we go something like that so we got 30 and 30 yeah all right so that's a good place to start now we can come back in to the effects turn these guys back on and we can start adjusting our lens blur is way too much way too high right now let's just try dropping everything down to 10 see where that gets us so I want it to feel a little bit out of focus like this but not so out of focus that we're not gonna be able to see anything let's try 20 on everybody There we go. I think that level of focus feels about right. Let's go ahead and lift this up a little more. So I see it intersecting with the console. That looks pretty good. Now the last thing we want to do is start stealing some of this hue saturation. And I'm just gonna drop it on each of these layers. So I have a blue one, a green one, and a red one again go ahead and screen these guys all onto each other. There we go. But I don't like the green being the furthest one back. So maybe what I want to do is just move my hue saturation first on all of these and then let's play with a little bit of position. So the red one let's see if we move that one a little further back that looks nicer and they're all a little too intense right now so I'm gonna come down to my glow for each one of them and maybe just half it Half it and half it. There we go. And move that down a little more. That's starting to look good. But now I can see that my blur is too high, so I will start fixing each one of those. Let's bring it back to 10. Sometimes the first guess is a little better. There we go. So I don't want to lose it completely, but I do want to be able to see what's going to happen with Eric here. So now that we've got our scene set up and the composite mostly ready, I'm going to want to come in and start playing with this digital noise effect. Actually, before I do that, I completely forgot we should see a little bit out the windows here. So. So let's go ahead and just grab a simple space texture. And I just went and downloaded this off of NASA's website. And let's go ahead and scale it up. Put it over there. And no, you know what? Uh, let's let's try putting a little blur on it. I don't think we actually need it. Yeah, because then it just comes out looking a little smudgy. There's not enough large detail here to really warrant that, but there we go. Now we've got some nice stars peering out through the window. Okay, now we can move on and deal with the glitchy animation. And to deal with that, let's go ahead and come into our, oops. Let's go ahead and come into our screen comp and then we'll come into Eric's comp here wait am I in the wrong one ah I have all of my keying on the wrong layer I did not pay attention when I pre-comped. All right, so we got that fixed. 
Now what I want to do is start bringing in some digital noise into this and some extra glitching. And a great way to add some really nice extra digital glitching is to use the time displacement. Time displacement is a wonderful little plugin, but if we drop it onto our comp immediately, we see we lose everything. This is a lot like uh, particular and masks. You have to pre-comp to get this to work properly. So we'll pre-comp this again, and we'll call this Eric GS for green screen. Oops, I almost did that same mistake again. GS, and we'll move everything into the new composition. There we go. Now we have a nice clean piece of footage. So if I drop my time displacement on it, right now what it's gonna do is use Eric's own layer to give us our displacement effect. And while that looks really weird, <laughs> it's not really what I'm going for. What I found works really well is use some noise video. And I found a couple free noise images here at 24-7 Video Co. And if I come over to their stock footage, they've got some really nice little digital glitchy looking stuff here. And it's royalty free for download. So I went ahead and downloaded two of their samples and I'm gonna scale it up and let's move it in time until their logo drops out. And now I can come back to Eric and I can choose that noise pattern. And we can start to see areas where we get some really crazy distortion-y effects on Eric's face. And what we can do is come into this guy and start playing with how much displacement and when. So we'll go to there, we'll go back to zero, we'll hold with no distortion for a second. And we can come back up to maybe two, hold there for a second, come back to one. And I'm just randomly adding these keyframes. There's no real rhyme or reason. We'll take a look at this when we're done and see what we think. I'll come in the middle here, break it up so it's not exactly a repeating pattern. And then we'll add another set of that pattern to the end. And let's go ahead and preview this and just see what we're getting. All right, that's looking pretty glitchy and messed up, but I think we can push it further. I'm gonna make another copy of this. I'm gonna grab my keyframes here and let's offset them a bit so that they're not in conjunction. And let's grab that second noise pattern. And again, let's scale it up and slide it over that logo is off the front. There we go. And I'm going to take this one and use my second noise pattern. And then what I can do is start coming in and playing with different transfer modes until I find something I like that's going to give me a much more complex digital distortion-y effect. That's pretty glitchy. So I think this is looking pretty good. It's got moments of clarity where you can just see him, but for the most part, it's pretty distorted. I like that quite a bit. So the next thing I'm gonna wanna do is give him a little bit of a background. And to do that, 
I'm going to go ahead and actually grab the same background I'm using for Amber Shot. And I'm going to scale it way up. And I'm going to grab my camera, lens blur, and I'm going to set it out of focus. Not too out of focus, but just enough. And I think I want to scale Eric up in this shot. I don't want him to be quite so small. I want it maybe looking like he's talking directly into a webcam. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and again, I'm going to vignette this whole thing. Just to make sure that Eric is the focus. Go ahead, grab that guy. I'll subtract it, I'll feather it out, there we go, there, that's looking pretty good. And I think I want to give Eric just a touch of color correction, maybe just a little tint, just to bring down some of that intensity. And that also gives me a chance, since I'm using transfer modes here, to create a more interesting color effect. There we go. Let's play through that again. Good. But we don't have anything in the background itself. So let's go ahead, turn these guys on. Let's bring them down a little bit. And let's do an additive mode, maybe. So what we'll do is we'll uh, find a level that looks good here. And we're getting some blackout here, which I don't like. So I'm going to go ahead and move those to the top so it's a little cleaner in that way. I'll just play with this for a second until I find a look that I think is looking pretty good. There we go. Let's go ahead and bring them down just a little more. I don't want to take too much focus away from Eric's face. And let's come back to our main comp and see what we've got. He's a little too out of focus now. Now we've lost all of that work that we've done. So let's come back and let's drop our camera lens blurs down a bit. Maybe just a five. So I don't want to lose all that beautiful work and be able to see all of that digital glitching. add one of them back to a more normal mode. And let's see what we've got. Okay, so here we go. We have the digital distortion looking really nice. I'm really happy with that effect. And I think we're pretty close to done here. I think the only thing I'd like to do is give a little bit of animation to our star field. She's supposed to be moving through space, but our star field is stuck. And that may actually be technically correct for uh, how outer space is, how vast it is, and how long it would take to notice a change in the stars. But watching it dead in the screen it just feels like no motion is happening at all. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab my offset here, drop it on my layer, my star field layer, and I'm just gonna set a couple keyframes. One at the beginning, and then one here at the end. Let's see, how's that feel for speed? Maybe a little fast. Maybe I should go something more like 900 just enough that it feels like we've got motion. And let's take a look at that. Okay, I think one little last touch. So I was looking at it, my eye caught 
just a little bit of disparity with the fact that the screen is slightly fuzzy, but the panels, but the control panels were not. And kind of as you get more things into shape in your composite, the more some little things will start popping out that you may not have noticed before. And that's a good thing. That means you're actually <laughs> getting it to a better level and your eye is starting to be able to distinguish other problems. And that looks really good. I'm really happy with this. We've got a nice digital set. We've got some nice illuminated holographic screens. And we've got this great digital distortion effect happening right in the foreground. So I think we've come to the end here. I hope you've learned something that you can use in your work. If you have any questions, please hit me up on Twitter or Facebook or in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. Go and create.